The resurrection of Jesus has massive implications concerning our past, our present, and our future. Because for the child of God, Jesus' resurrection is our resurrection. That means there is healing for the past, there is comfort for today, and there is hope for tomorrow. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Okay, a few weeks back, uh, my wife and I were walking uh, through our neighborhood, and, and she's more notice, she notices things better like this than I do. She's far more observant about it. She said, I, I think that spring is late. Like the buds, normally these trees, and she'd kind of point them out. She goes, they were bloomed already at this time last year. And, and so it got us kind of uh, thinking about, you know, what's the cause of that or, or why does that happen? And so then when we were preparing, or when I was preparing uh, for this passage, we were driving to Cincinnati this, this past week uh, to, to get a cast put on my daughter's arm, and um, that's great. I mean, just the absolute best case scenario. I'm going to work on that while I tell you this story, though. So we um, are on our way up there, and she's uh, you know, talking about this again because the, the trees are just absolutely beautiful, and they're coming into bloom, and so she kind of Googled, mainly to keep me awake, why does this happen? Like, why is spring delayed? And so here we go. We're almost there. We just embrace our problems and we'll fight through them together. Uh, so, so there's different reasons. So if the weather is too warm warm early in the winter season, right? Like so um, maybe you have a, a cold fall, but then heat comes back in a certain section of the winter. Um, and if that warm weather lasts for a while, it's going to signal the trees that it's time to come out of, of being dormant. But then obviously when the cold comes back, it, it has uh, harsh results. If it's a warm fall, like it doesn't get cold fast enough, there can be a signal to the trees that it's time to go dormant, but they don't have uh, the right length of day, like too much daylight, etc., cetera, uh, can cause a problem too. If they don't have the right combination of day length and temperature to kind of shut them down completely, then that can delay their, their death, which then will delay them coming back to life. If you don't have a certain period of warm days in the spring, so there's kind of got to be a stretch of warm days, the trees may stay dormant for a little longer. So you might have three or four warm days, but then it goes back to being cold. So and I know you didn't come here for science class, but um, if the trees don't get signaled properly, uh, they don't come back to life. Another reason, and this is true for us uh, this past season, is if there's an extremely harsh winter, one of the things that can happen is it can cause death to the buds that are already starting to form on those trees. And when that happens, and this is crazy to me, the trees will actually reform new buds to produce new growth. Here's my point, though. I am going somewhere with this. The past patterns of spring coming, though, even when spring is delayed, there's still a confidence that it's going to come. That life will return to the trees. That life will return to the plants. And this is true in our faith as well. God's past patterns inform his future promises. God's past patterns inform his future promises. Uh, and this infuses us for our present perseverance. If you've been with us, we're in a sermon series which ends today called His Resurrection your resurrection. And what we're seeing over these past four weeks is that the resurrection of Jesus for the children of God is in fact our resurrection. And it doesn't just impact our today, it impacts our past, our present, and our future. Week one, we talked about the reality of resurrection. We kind of laid the groundwork for that. Uh, week two, which was Easter, we talked about resurrection for our past. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Last week we saw Mary in the midst of devastation and grief and pain, loss of her Savior and best friend, Jesus, at the tomb weeping. And there in her pain, her today, Jesus met her. And we looked at resurrection for today. This week, in our final sermon of this series, we're going to look to the future. 
But we're going to go to the book of Hosea, which is in the past. And there's a reason for that. What I want us to see today is how these themes all tie together. To say it more explicitly, God's past patterns of bringing dead things to life are in the bedrock of our faith in the future promises of resurrection. So resurrection in the past informs our hope for future resurrection. And this future hope infuses our present life today with strength for remaining faithful to the end. So the past, present, future implications of Jesus' resurrection all tie together in Hosea chapter 6 today. Maybe an unexpected passage, but I'm excited about it um, and how this all ties together. So, Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea was a prophet about 750 years before Jesus came to earth and uh, as a baby. And Hosea... Uh, ministered for about 30 years. Uh, he went uh, between both kingdoms, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel. If you remember, there were only three kings. And those of you who have you maybe grown up in Sunday school or read through the Bible, you have Saul, David, and Solomon. They all reign over a unified kingdom of Israel. But then the kingdoms divide. And you have ten tribes that go to the north and two tribes that go to the south. Judah and Benjamin are the two tribes in the, in the south and ten tribes in the north, including Ephraim, which in the book of Hosea, Ephraim is a code word for the kingdom of Israel in the north because that was one of the tribes that was a part of that northern kingdom. Hosea ministers in both kingdoms. That's not always the case. Some of the prophets are sent to Judah. Some of the prophets are sent to the kingdom of Israel. But he ministers in both. Some of the kings that he, uh, during his ministry, are uh, kings like Jeroboam in the north and kings like Uzziah and Hezekiah in the south. So that wasn't an Amish convention. Those were the actual uh, names of the kings. If, if, you're, uh, if you grew up in Sunday school, you're probably familiar with some of those names. If you've grown up in church, you're probably familiar with some of those names. And that informs us today because those kings come into play in Hosea chapter 6. What else is interesting is the placement of the book of Hosea in scriptures. And not only in scriptures as, as we have them, because we have a, a way that our uh, books are ordered in our Bible, the Jewish uh, people in the day of Jesus would have had a way, that was all of their scriptures, the Old Testament was all that they had. And they would have referred to it as the Tanakh, that had been one of the ways that they talked about the Hebrew scriptures. And that's more of an acronym. The T stands for Torah, which is the books of the law, uh, those first five books of the Bible. Um, the N, so Tanakh, the N in Tanakh would stand for Nebuhim, which is the prophets. And then the K would have been the Ketu, Ketuvim, which is the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Those books would have kind of rounded out the Hebrew scriptures. Now, what's interesting about Hosea is that Hosea was a the lead-off hitter in what's called the Book of the Twelve, what the Jewish people would have called the Book of the Twelve. We call them the Minor Prophets. If you've studied, you know, again, if you study the Old Testament, kind of how it's broken down, you have 12 Minor Prophets. Their books are smaller. Uh, their ministry wasn't as expansive as prophets like Isaiah. His book is huge. Jeremiah, his book is huge. But these minor prophets would have been the book of the twelve. And Hosea is the leadoff hitter. There's a theme that develops through the book of the twelve. First, they confront the sin of God's people. Then they talk about the punishment that is to come. And then they talk about restoration to come. That's kind of how they flow. If you read through those twelve books in one sitting, those will be the themes that you'll pick up on. It's all about the sin of God's people, the sin of God's people, the sin of God's people, then the future punishment to come, then the future restoration to come. All of the books carry those themes, but they primarily focus on what? So Hosea kicks off talking about the sins of God's people, and in particular, he goes back to two kings, Ahaz and Manahem, who were kings of Israel and Judah. If you were to go back to 2 Kings chapter 15, 
you would see the king of Israel at the time cowering before the Assyrians. So the Assyrian government is a threat to them, and he sees them as a threat, and instead of turning to God for security and safety, he goes and taxes the people heavily and pays a tribute to the Assyrian king. Very next chapter, chapter 16, you go to the kingdom of Judah, and you see their king, Ahaz, do the exact same thing. He cowers before the Assyrian kingdom. He does something even worse. He desecrates the temple of God. He looks at the way Assyria worships and he says, if I want to get in good with the king of Assyria, then I need to take our temple and I need to make it look like it looks like in Assyria. We need to worship the gods that Assyria worships. And if we do that, if we conform to the Assyrian way of worship, then, then we'll be uh, seen in a good light by the king of Assyria. And they both capitulate. They both cower before the king of Assyria. That's where Hosea comes in. In chapter 5, he calls them out on it. He says the pride of Israel testifies to his face. Right? We don't need any more witnesses. Israel's pride in this. They thought they could figure it out. They thought they could pay it off. They thought they could find their own security instead of turning to God. Their pride of Israel testifies against them. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with them. With their flocks and herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He has withdrawn from them. And so the point that Hosea is making is that the consequences for your actions of seeking security and safety outside of the Lord is going to be a terrible fall. Not only that, but a withdrawing of the presence of God. Verses 13 and 15, he goes on. When Ephraim saw his sickness, what he means is their weakness, right? Like they looked at Assyria and they said, we're weak, we can't stand against Assyria. And Judah saw his womb, saw his inability to stand against Assyria. Then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. But here's the ticket. But he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. This is important, by the way. The, the kingdom of God, the, the people of God, when they look outside of God for security, for comfort, for rescue, they are always looking in the wrong place. Because God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, has promised them uh, security, comfort, and safety if they walk with him, if they are in covenant with him, And so they turn away from that. They turn to someone who cannot cure them. And what God prophesies to Ephraim and Judah, he says, I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and their distress earnestly seek me. The picture there is a lion who kills an animal, eats his fill, and then just leaves and goes. God says there's going to be punishment coming because you looked to the wrong God. You looked to the wrong king. Now, Israel has two options. Now, they can believe God, or they can continue to believe themselves. Thankfully, they choose to believe God, and what they believe... God's, what they believe is true first is that they need resurrection. They need healing. They need brought back to life. And so, the very next verse, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, they say together, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. Until you know your need for resurrection... There will be no resurrection. Until you know your need for life outside of yourself, there will be no life outside of yourself. So the call is return to the Lord. Those who go through this life without humbling themselves to own their need for resurrection will never know resurrection. So today the question will be, do you know that you can't do it? Do you know that you can't bring eternal life to yourself? Do you know that you cannot get yourself into a relationship of, with God through your own works and your own strength? Do you know that you can't bring about the healing in your life that you desperately need? 
Are you willing to own the fact today that you need resurrection? To be raised to life, you must own the fact that you are as good as dead. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among, among whom we all once lived the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The Bible is clear. We are born in sin, separated from God, incapable of raising ourselves to life. And the first key that Hosea points out for the people of God in that day was that they have to own their need. For resurrection. Step one of being assured of future resurrection is your acknowledgement of your deadness. Then and only then does the promise of resurrection come, and it comes immediately in verse two. After two days, Hosea says he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. I get really excited about this verse. It's not a prophecy, but it is a marker, a pointer to Jesus. And I'm going to explain to you how, and I'm super excited to do that. In this verse, there is a pattern that begins to emerge. We quoted Nancy Guthrie a few weeks back. She's a brilliant student and teacher of the Bible. Uh, she said, we, we read a list a few weeks back of ways that we see Jesus in the Old Testament. And one of them that we saw is in patterns that find their fulfillment in Jesus. There's two patterns in verse 2. There's a pattern that God raises dead things to life. We see that emerge in verse 2. And there's another pattern, a pattern that particularly has to do with life and promises coming on the third day. This is great. Remember Abraham, by the way, first pattern, bringing dead things to life. Remember Abraham. Hebrews refers to him being as good as dead. And yet having no offspring. But God had promised him that his offspring, his children and his children's children would outnumber the sands of the sea and the, the stars in the sky. And so uh, Sarah, his wife, her womb is dead. And he himself is as good as dead. But yet the year of their 100th birthday and 90th birthday, respectfully, they're having a baby shower. Because God brings dead things back to life. Remember the people of God on the banks of the Red Sea. Mountains on either side. The Red Sea in front of them, un unable to cross it. No boats, nothing, right? Too late for swimming lessons and the Egyptians are, are bearing down behind them. They're as good as dead. But in the night, God builds a super highway across the Red Sea. And he brings dead things back to life. We could go on, right? If this was a, a, uh, a community group, we could, could go around the room and cite different stories from Scripture where God brings dead things back to life. It's his M.O. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. That's Isaiah. Ezekiel says, I will, uh, quoting uh, the Lord, he says, I will give them uh, one heart and a new spirit and I will put within them, uh, I will put within them, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. He brings dead things back to life. It's his M.O. Another prophecy in Ezekiel, uh, we won't read the whole thing, but, but there's this, this scene where he tells Ezekiel in this valley of dead uh, bones, all these dead bones, he says, pray over these bones. That they'll come back to life and then God puts muscles and flesh on these bones and then they, they don't have any air in their lungs. It's a vision, but in that vision, he, he, he prophesies now breath into their lungs and they, they, come back, they come back to life. God brings dead things back to life. This is a vision Ezekiel has that is for the people of God that he is going to bring their hearts and souls back to belief in his covenant. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. God brings dead things back to life. Of course, this continues with Jesus' ministry. 
with Jairus' daughter, dead, brought back to life. Lazarus, dead in the tomb, brought back to life. The point is, as old as Scripture is, God has been bringing dead things back to life for as long as people have had a problem with death. Not just death physically, but death of our souls. Death to sin. Deadness inside of us. He's been bringing dead things back to life. Pattern number two, this one's exciting too, is God keeping promises and bringing life on the, on the third day. This is cool. Page one of the Bible, we get the uh, narrative of creation. And what happens on the third day? On the third day, plants and mountains and vegetation come up out of this dead earth where previously no life had existed. And they are brought to life out of nothing. Three days later, what happens? Animals and humans are created. The humans are created from the dead dust of the ground. And he breathes breath into their lungs on the third day. And in that, a pattern begins to emerge that we see through Scripture. Three parts to the pattern. One, God creates new life where there was once death. Number two, God establishes a promise with his people. There's promises that he makes there uh, in the garden. And then third, the event always kind of takes place on a mountain. I don't know if you knew this about Eden, but there's a river that flows from Eden. So it's likely up on a mountain, although we don't know where it is. Watch this happen again. Abraham is tested in Genesis 22, if you're familiar with the story. He's told to take his only son Isaac up a mountain, and there he's to kill him as a sacrifice. And the test is, will he trust God, right? Trust God's promise to provide him offspring that outnumber the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, even though he's being called to sacrifice his own son. And if you read that passage on the third day, he looks up the mountain and they go up. To be tested. And on the third day, God provides a lamb in his, the place of Isaac. And that lamb is killed instead of Isaac. And atonement is brought. And he makes a promise once again to Abraham saying, see, I will keep my covenant with you. And it all happens on a mountain. Dead things brought back to life or death avoided for Isaac. Promises made on a mountain on the third day. Fast forward to Exodus chapter 19. The people of God come rolling out of Egypt. God has per, uh, brought them out into freedom. And as they are coming to Mount Sinai, what does God say to them? He says, wait. And on the third day, he says it four times in that passage. On the third day, I will come down to Mount Sinai and I will speak to you. And he gives them new life, a new identity. They become the people of God. He is their God and they are his people. He gives them new promises, and it all happens on the mountain. There's a pattern. A pattern of on the third day, God keeping promises to his children and bringing dead things back to life. And if you go on to uh, Jesus' life, he goes up a mountain for our atonement. Three days later, he is brought up out of the ground, just like a, a, a bud budding up in the spring. Out of that dead ground, he rises, and a new promise is established with the people of God. You see, this has always been the plan. And so when Hosea talks about on the third day life, he's not just making up some eloquent little thing. He's not just throwing out random numbers. This has always been a thing that God has done with his people. And it points us to Jesus. The Apostle Paul saw this pattern. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. He knew Hosea. Guaranteed. He may have had him memorized. We'll see here in just a second. He's going to quote it again directly. He's thinking about it as he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 15. His confidence in future resurrection is rooted in the past patterns of Jesus raising dead things or God raising dead things back to life. He continues. 
in verses 20 through 22. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now what's happening here subtly is that Paul is shifting as he talks to the church at Corinth. He's shifting. He cites Adam. He cites the death that was brought into the world by Adam. Adam's first sin. They ate the fruit. And the Bible says that death uh, passed upon all men for all have sinned. That was the initial moment when death came into the world, when sin was brought into the world. The first Adam messed it up. But Jesus, the better Adam, the second Adam, comes in. And he culminates this pattern of Jesus bringing dead things back to life over and over and over again. And he does what the first Adam couldn't do. He brings righteousness and life to the people of God through his sacrifice and his resurrection. And Paul is shifting to our future hope because as you come to the end of the chapter, he says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come uh, to pass the saying that is written in Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? When the perishable, Paul says, puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written of death is swallowed up in victory of death. Where is your victory of death? Where is your staying? You think he wasn't reading Isaiah? You think he wasn't aware of the pattern of God bringing dead things back to life? Are you, are you, are you, do you think he wasn't aware that that pattern found its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus being raised to life on the third day? This is how God has always worked. This is what God has always promised. This is his M.O., bringing dead things back to life, and the pattern finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And because of that, we look to future hope of resurrection. He can state with confidence that God will raise us from the dead. That the children of God in Christ are now made immortal are now brought to a place where we do not perish, but instead have everlasting life with God. Our future hope of resurrection is rooted and grounded in the past patterns of God bringing dead things back to life. And it's most strongly rooted in God bringing Jesus back to life. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, how then shall we live? If our God has always been bringing dead things back to life, and that pattern culminates in Jesus, and Jesus has been raised from the dead, and therefore we have a future hope of eternal life with God, how do we respond? Jose has a simple application. Let's know Him. Let's know God. The God who raises life uh, from the dead is worthy of knowing. So let us know him. Let us press in to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. We're applying the sermon now. Hosea is helping us do it. Two things. Press in to know the Lord. Know him. And two, trust his promise that if we seek to know him, he will reveal himself to us. First, know, know God. Charles Spurgeon says it like this. Do you know God? Do you know God in the majesty of his justice? Do you know God in the splendor of his love? Do you know God in the fullness of his power to save? He's talking about the very basic tenets of the gospel. If you do, you have begun to know him. And you've also begun to know yourself, for he knows not himself who does not know something of God. And then he says this, and I love it. Oh, 
to know the Father as my Father who hath kissed me and put the best robe upon me. Oh, to know the Son as my brother in whose garments I am accepted and stand comely or beautifully in the sight of God. Oh, to know the Spirit as the quickener and the divine indweller and illuminator by whose light alone we see and whose life we live. And he goes on to say, to know the Lord, that is true religion. I say again, any religion, whatever it is, churchianity or nonconformity or whatever you like, if it does not lead you to know God, it is of no use whatever. The point is this, know God. Press in to know him. There's all the practical ways. Pick up your Bible and read it. Pray, fast, uh, meditate, memorize the scriptures, serve alongside other Christians. All this stuff, right, that becomes just like these Sunday school answers over time. We all just say, oh, we know what the things are that we're supposed to do. And they can become mundane, checklist. We just have to check off if we're going to be Christians, especially in maybe a legalistic uh, place like, you know, Appalachia and West Virginia. They just become things that, that we have to do. These are ways to know God who raises the dead. Press in to know God. That's the call. And here's the promise. So first, press in to know God. And two, trust the promise that if you press in to know God, you will know him. Another translation of Hosea 6.3 says, Then shall we know him. We shall. It's a guarantee that we will know him when we follow on to know the Lord. If you truly desire to know God, if you truly pursue knowing God, he's not going to hide himself from you. He's not going to, you know, like <clears throat> cause you to like have to go on some scavenger hunt where you have to find out, you know, the, the key or whatever, like being in some escape room or something. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. Jesus made that promise as well. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one to the one who knocks it will be, it will be opened. Jose gives two images of this real quick as we close. The morning sun and the spring rain. The way God will reveal himself to you if you seek to know him is like the morning sun and the spring rain. We get those images. Right bef before the dawn, it's dark. You can see nothing without artificial light. But when the sunrise comes, the sun not only reveals itself, like you see the sun itself, but by the sun you see everything else brightly. That's the image. That if you truly seek to know God, if you press in to know God, he will reveal himself to you. And in knowing him, you will know everything else you need to know more clearly over time. The morning rain, we get that idea too, but it's a good analogy because it's, it says not only does rain fall upon dry ground, but it actually penetrates down into the soul of that dry ground and it transforms it, right? The water soaks down in. And it says God will reveal himself to you in that way. Not just some external knowledge and understanding, but something that penetrates into your soul and transforms you and changes you. And those dead seeds that are down in the ground, when the spring rain falls, they're brought to life. They're resurrected and life grows. That's the promise. That we can know him now abundantly and one day know him fully. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. We long for that day when he wipes away every tear. We long for that day when sickness is no more. We long for that day when death is no more. And that is the future promise of resurrection. But the more glorious part of that promise is that we will know God fully. We will know who he is. We will know his heart. We will know his love. We will know his forgiveness. We will know his grace. We will know his power fully. And in that, you, you, you cannot even begin, none of us can begin to imagine the amount of comfort, peace, joy that will come from, from knowing God fully. 
who he is, why he is, what he does, and how he does it to the full. But you can know him today. You can't know him at that level, right? Like that's a future promise of resurrection, that full, complete knowledge of God. But you can begin to know him now. Abundantly, the Bible says. To know who he is. And you do that through the word of God, with the people of God, and with the disciplines of knowing God. And if you seek to know him, he will reveal himself to you. And so let's press in to know God and must trust his promises. Paul finishes in a similar way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Keep pursuing what it means to know God and to become like Jesus. That one thing I forgot to say about this knowledge of God is that it's like a student and a lover. like a, It's a romantic yeah, intimate knowledge of God. Like we, we don't just know him like a student knows book knowledge. We know him uh, as the bride of Christ and he is our husband. We know him intimately. We, we are to, to, to have a relationship with him that goes beyond just, just head knowledge. And if you press in to know him that way, he will reveal himself to you. There's hope in the resurrection. And this is how it all ties together. God's past patterns of bringing dead things to life are in the bedrock of our faith in the future promises of resurrection. And this future hope infuses us uh, in our present life with strength to remain faithful to the end. So I don't know what your struggles are today. I don't know what your fears are today. I don't know what's going on specifically in each and every one of your lives. But the strength for today comes from two places. It comes from looking back at God's patterns of raising dead things to life. And looking forward with hope to the future promises of that same resurrection being ours. And one day it will be true and we can bank on it because God has always delivered on his promises. So be steadfast today. Immovable today. Always abounding in, in the work of the Lord, becoming more and more like Jesus. Faith and hope rooted in past resurrection and future resurrection. And if you're not a Christian, trust Jesus today. The truth that was revealed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that just like Hosea pointed out, we need life from outside of ourselves. We're sinful, we're lost, we're broken. The Bible says that, that our sin has a punishment of being separated from God forever. We cannot uh, overcome that punishment. We cannot overcome that sentence on our own. And so if you're lost today, if you're not a Christian, you have to own that. But he also revealed that Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and in that he made it possible for your sins to be forgiven and you to be made right with God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Let's pray. God, that's a lot of drinking from a fire hose. I haven't been able to wrap my brain around all that this week. There's a lot of big picture ideas in there. There's a lot of details in there. But the fact of the matter is this. That today in our brokenness, today in our pain, today in our doubt, Today in our apathy, today in our loss, we have hope. And that hope is not in ourselves, but in you who have the power to raise the dead and have done it time and time and time again in the past and will do it in the future through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So give us faith today to believe your promises. Give us trust today in future resurrection. Not just in the end, when you raise us from death to life, but as you continue to raise our hearts and our souls to life, the people that we're praying for, the, the marriages that are struggling, the, the situations that seem hopeless, the depression that seems in, in impossible to escape from, the anxiety that's crushing, all of those things, that there is a hope in the midst of them. And it's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus. Give us that faith today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.